I have a day to kill before I meet up with conservation officer Rob Farr. He's the guy you heard about in the last episode, the one that helped launch Operation Roadhouse. I want to make the most of my time on the Lake of the Ozarks while I'm here, so I'm meeting up with Rick Reno. All, these are all my dogs. Oh, nice. He's the owner of Rick's Ore House, a local restaurant, motel, and marina that is apparently the place to be during snagging season. With his bright blue polo shirt, khaki shorts, and square frame glasses, Rick looks nothing like his outdoorsman customers. You all are taking your life in your own house. <laughs> well, I said, I'm getting ready to tell you, you probably... don't know his luck, yeah, I'm going to give him one of them my phone number so they can call me. <laughs> Besides being a successful entrepreneur, the 50-something-year-old has also been the Benton County treasurer for over 20 years. <laughs> right. Rick's natural political charm works well at the Ore House. It's like I've stumbled into hanging out with a local celebrity. How are you outlaws doing today? Hey, how are you? Happy well, birthday. Thank you. Yeah. We almost share the same day. Mine's Monday. Really? Yep. Well, I can tell you're a lot younger than I am, so yeah. <laughs> We're a 20-minute drive from Main Street, but it feels like we could be hours away. According to Rick, we're on what he calls the baloney side of the lake, compared to the prime rib fancy part further downstream. Life on this side of the lake feels very zen. We crack open a few of Rick's favorite beers, Michelob Light, and cast off from the dock for a ride to the Truman Dam. We're snagging headquarters for the lake because we were the only launching ramp that had decent water in front of it where you could put your boat in. We also do a snagging tournament that uh, pays out $10,000. So that brings a lot of fishermen out. I think that's why you see people leave the city so much and come down here on weekends because it goes back to a time that they remember when neighbors were friendly and people helped each other. Now in the last episode, I explained how this story first crossed my desk, back when I was running the food website Munchies. And that is true. But it's not the whole story of why I've been fascinated with it ever since. The thing is, I'm not just some city slicker following a journalistic lead. I'm very much a Texas girl. And in the middle of the pandemic, I made the choice to move back home to Austin. I didn't hate New York City. And it wasn't just that life moves at a less intense pace down here. But being back in Texas makes it really easy to access the great outdoors. I think you're either an all in nature person or somewhere in between. And I'm definitely a nature person. I've got two adult children that were born and raised down here. And I think that's how what probably kept me here was wanting to raise a family down here. Like Rick, I was also lucky enough to grow up a little bit off the grid. My childhood was spent building forts in the woods, fishing and gem collecting. And once you step into a relationship of reciprocity with nature, the back and forth respect, I guess, for what happens when you look after one another, it never leaves you. So when I had the chance to see these mythic paddlefish for myself, I got here as fast as I could. We just arrived at Truman Dam. We're on the back side of Truman Dam. I fish pretty much whenever I can. But in Texas, I mainly fish for bass. I am a terrible fly fisherman, but I love it. It's a great excuse to get out of town and spend some time disconnected from emails and TikTok. But I also know it can be easy to overdo it, to take too much from nature, and paddlefish are endangered, meaning they're quickly approaching extinction. So when I heard that people were casually throwing away fish carcasses older than adult humans, old enough to say, have a mortgage, it pissed me off. The Missouri Conservation Department built Hidden Valley Hatchery, and they raised paddlefish and restocked the Lake of the Ozarks, among a few other lakes here. And that has provided an ongoing population of fish that supports the season the fishermen come and fish. In those six weeks, we take in almost as much money as we take in the three months of summer. That helps a lot on the bottom line when you own a business on the lake. When you fish, 
there's rules and minimum size limits. Anything smaller than the guidelines say, you've got to catch and release. This way, only the most mature fish are taken, and the species survives. It's a careful balance. And the thing about paddlefish is that they don't reproduce easily. Here's fisheries biologist Kim Graham explaining paddlefish spawning cycles in a kitschy 1980s PBS documentary. Paddlefish is an animal that can live to extremely long ages. Uh, they can commonly live 20 to 30 years. They, the females don't spawn each year. Uh, their spawning requirements are very, very exacting. There's probably only a handful of biologists that have ever seen a paddlefish reproduce naturally. The Missouri Department of Conservation has worked hard to maintain paddlefish populations. It's why state law limits snaggers to just two paddlefish per day. So these mysterious poachers were not only killing older fish, they were stopping them from reproducing altogether. If you care about having fish in your rivers, then it's about the most dangerous thing you can do. These people coming from out of town they either didn't know or just didn't care. I'm Helen Holliman. From Imperative Entertainment and Vespucci, this is the Paddlefish Caviar Heist. Episode 2, Spanky Defray. If you think cash back at thousands of your favorite stores sounds too good to be true, think again. With Rakuten, you can save on whatever you're buying for the holidays. So while you're getting gifts for friends and family, get some cash back for yourself, too. Don't forget festive home decor, party outfits, and that trip to see your fam. Because shopping for everything is much more magical with cash back. Rakuten makes it so easy. Here's how it works. Rakuten partners with stores you know and love. Places like American Eagle, Aveda, Finish Line, GameStop, Lancome. And more. These stores actually pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers. And Rakuten shares that money with you as cash back. You can even stack coupons and deals on top of cash back. Cha-ching! Shop at Rakuten.com or by using the Rakuten app and you'll get your cash back payments through PayPal or check. It's that easy. Start your holiday shopping with Rakuten now to save money at over 3,500 stores. Join for free at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Rakuten.com. On a winter night in a small community near Denver, Colorado, Jim Matthews arrived home late. He expected to find his 12-year-old daughter who'd been dropped off after a Christmas concert, but he called out for her. Hey, Janelle! And the house was eerily quiet. His daughter's shoes were on the floor, but she was gone. And it would be 35 years before she would be found dead. After the discovery of Janelle Matthews' body in 2019, the police turned their attention to a man who had told law enforcement years ago that he knew something, but they dismissed him. The man did seem obsessed with the case, but is that all he was? A true crime fanatic or a killer? Now, a jury will decide if Janelle's murderer was hiding in plain sight the entire time. Wondery and Campside Media's podcast Suspect is back for a second season with a story that attempts to separate one man's true crime obsession from a motive for murder. Hey, Prime members, listen to the Amazon Music exclusive podcast Suspect, Vanished in the Snow, in the Amazon Music app. Download the app today. The sun is setting as we tie Rick's boat up to the marina. Rick leads us up from the dock into the back porch door of the oar house to give us a tour. It's packed to the gills. On the way in, we walk past some signs for the upcoming Testicle Festival, which includes local delicacies that the hunting community enjoys, like turkey fries and Rocky Mountain oysters. And if it isn't already clear from the festival's name, those aren't the oysters or fries you might be used to. There's a shuffleboard table in the corner and a sign behind the bar that reads, no Russian vodka here. Toby Keith's songs play in the background. Wooden oars cover the entire ceilings and walls around the place, engraved with the names of fishermen and the families that have come here for generations. I can see why it's the spot during snagging season. I'm gonna have to count, I get that question all the time. As Rick banters with some customers, a short, stocky gentleman walks over to us, beer koozie in hand. 
wearing a cowboy hat with American Proud printed on the inside brim. His tan, sun-kissed skin is the color of a fry leather boot. When Rick got to play, we were elated because, yeah, he's a great guy, yeah. If it wasn't for him, this place would be, well, it wouldn't be here. There'd be no hub. This is Steve. He's a member of Little Mexico, a devoted gang of 15 seasonal paddlefish snaggers who've been coming to stay at the motel part of the ore house, well, for forever. Little Mexico has their own ore on a wall, but Steve's photo is all over the wall of fishing fame. Imagine a series of smiling faces, each proudly showing off their biggest catch, from crappie to catfish, and of course, right up to paddlefish. Steve's on there for catching a huge female catfish. My stepson caught her and fought that fish for 45, 50 minutes or better, maybe an hour. People were videoing the fight. He got her in the boat, because he kept going. I said, come on, don't be a drama queen, get that fish in. He said, you don't understand, this is a fish. We took that picture and then we put her right back to one. Like you're an aquatic bull rider. That's what I'm getting. You like to wrestle the beast. Yeah. I got my back broke riding a bull named Twister. And he threw me about from, well, here in the other bar. And I broke my back. Yeah, that was maybe 88, 1988, yeah. But that ended it. I never did it again because I wasn't going to take a chance. But I didn't even have to do that, you know. That was a dumb part. I'm not sure if you caught that. But Steve is, in fact, a former bull rider who gave it up after a ride with a bull named Twister, forced him into retirement. But he's never lost the taste for trying to tame giants. But then Steve switches topics and begins talking about Russian poachers. They would net them and they ripped their belly open if it was a female, good. They put it on a belt, it went up into a big tractor trailer. They processed it all and it went out the other side and they hauled it off as caviar. I've finally found my first eyewitness. And it's high dollar. My God, it's high dollar. So, lo and behold, they killed off a bunch because if it was a male, they cut it open, no eggs, they just threw it back in the water. I'm about to ask more about Operation Roadhouse, but then he mentions a name I hadn't heard of in everything I've read on the subject. There was a man named DeFreeze that the conservation, I don't know how many years they tried to catch him or needed to get enough evidence on him, but that's what happened to the spoonbill population around here. They were killed off a long time ago by those people because they would net those fish to get the eggs, and it, they did it at night, of course. We can't get caught doing this. To freeze? Or is it to fray? Either way, is that a Russian name? Steve describes finding hundreds of paddlefish carcasses floating up around the lake. This was definitely a poaching ring. We found like, I don't know, 1,300 of them up here in the sloop that they had cut open and just left in the water. The males and the females, they took the eggs and just threw them back. But that happened, and then the dam up here, in the flood of 93. But if Steve the bull rider is talking about the Truman Dam flooding in 1993, then he can't be talking about Operation Roadhouse. That was much later on. Not wanting to be late for dinner at Rob Farr's, we finish our drinks, close our tab, and wish Rick good luck with the testicle festival. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. But what exactly is an influencer? Well, there is a woman who went the distance, who went beyond the dazzle, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. She had power, real power, and longevity, influencing generations. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I know she was loud. I know she was hysterically funny. I know she swore. But Elizabeth said how painfully shy she was. She went on perfume tours, and the places were mobbed just to see her. She was starting to try and take control of her life, but then tragedy and life kind of got in the way. I'm Katy Perry. 
And Elizabeth Taylor has fascinated, inspired, and influenced me as an artist, woman, and an advocate. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth the First. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. There is a woman who went the distance, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I'm Katy Perry. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth the First. Elizabeth the First, the podcast, wherever you listen. Rob Farr's house is hidden in plain sight. It's one of those earth houses, the kind that's literally built into the side of the land, so only the roof can be seen from the driveway. Rob is grilling steaks when we walk down some hilly steps to the front of the house, which looks out onto a sprawling backyard with a thriving vegetable garden and a forest behind it. A tall, gray-haired man in his 60s, Rob looks every bit the retired law enforcement officer in a black t-shirt, baseball cap, and shorts. Rob and his wife Jacqueline now spend their days working on restoring their land back to its natural state. Fishing bears. The house is furnished with neatly arranged heirlooms, like Rob's turkey tails he's hunted since he was a boy, and tribal artwork from Jacqueline's tribe, the Potawatomi. This is a Sakari International Award. It goes along with this. In his office, which looks like the inside of a Bass Pro Shop, one wall is completely covered in awards for his conservation efforts. Rob speaks very humbly about it all. He'll tell you. Lots of people get these awards, which is so not true. He was Wildlife Officer of the Year. Missouri sent him down to Florida. And out of 22 states? Yeah, and territories. And he won that award out of the, the 22 states. So that was really... That was at the end of his career. That was, and then you uh, retired the next year, or no, two years? No, no, it was in 2014 we went there and I retired in 17. Okay, three years. So it was a nice uh, cap to his uh, career. Wow, mm-hmm. and is that turquoise? The, now that's stuff Jacqueline gave me. Beautiful. Was this yeah. written during, for your naming ceremony? Oh right? yeah, for my naming ceremony through the tribe. After a Midwestern dinner of grilled steaks and corn on the cob, we sit down in the living room and begin to chat. Rob is reserved, but he gradually warms up and agrees to let us ask him a few questions about his 30-plus year career. The majority of our job is done enforcing the rules and regulations of the Wildlife Code and other laws in the state of Missouri. I always said that uh, 10% of the people that never, ever violate any regulation, and you got 10% of the people that do it frequently, and it's the 80% that's left over that you influence. And you do it by several different ways, through education, through law enforcement. When was the moment that you knew that you wanted to do this? I was born with a desire to be outside, and everything outdoors interested me. In the third grade, my teacher had a conservation agent come to our class to give a presentation. And in walked this uh, good-looking guy in a beautiful uniform, uh, had a gun belt and a gun on, and he was talking about all the things that interested me. And I decided right then in the third grade that that is what I wanted to do when I grew up, and I stuck with it and uh, was one of the lucky people that was chosen for this position. I feel very lucky that I was chosen, and then after I was chosen, I had made up my mind that I was going to prove to the people that chose me that they made the right decision. A few years after graduating from the training program, Rob is sent to Warsaw. It was a beautiful place to be. There was a lot of activity there, and I was young and ambitious, and uh, I just felt like it was a good fit for me. So (laughs) I guarantee you in Benton County, there is a lot to do every day. There's no slow time in this county for a conservation agent. Right from the start, he's aware of the high levels of risk. Number one, everybody that you contact is either armed with a knife or a gun or whatever. 
And number two, you're usually by yourself because there's not very many of us. And number three, you're usually 45 minutes from any backup unless you're prepared ahead of time. So you're out there by yourself at two or three o'clock in the morning and things happen. And uh, I remember one officer uh, stopped a guy fishing at a lake at a state park and found out that an hour before he'd robbed a bank. There's only one thing that brings in more money than illegal wildlife, and that's drugs. Illegal wildlife is a multi-billion dollar activity worldwide, and it's a big threat to wildlife populations, depending on what they're after. I tell Rob we've just been hanging out at Rick's Ore House, where we heard the name Spanky DeFray. I wonder, is he part of Operation Roadhouse? Though he's retired, Rob won't reveal anything that might compromise the operations his colleagues are still running. I get it. But Rob knew Spanky DeFray. This wasn't Roadhouse. In fact, he'd seen caviar poachers in Warsaw before. It's the early 1980s, and Rob is brand new in his role. One day, he gets a phone call. It's a Missouri fisheries biologist named Kim Graham, the one we heard earlier in that PBS documentary. He's calling to warn Rob that sturgeon populations are crashing worldwide. We'll come back to how these global forces ended up in Warsaw in a later episode. But for now, just remember it's the sturgeon eggs that are typically turned into caviar. This highly prized food is suddenly hard to come by. Kim says that before long, the Warsaw paddlefish are bound to attract poachers. He called me and he said, you need to be watching the spoonbill down there because they've created a market for spoonbill eggs to make caviar. They're hitting some places in the United States now. It's just a matter of time before they show up in Warsaw. So I started watching. A few years later, Kim Graham's fears come true. Our first indication that we were having problems in Missouri occurred about 1985, 86, 87, when fishermen began telling us that, hey, all we're catching are small paddlefish. We're not catching the large ones anymore, particularly the females. At least the numbers were going down. Our biological information, our surveys, kind of showed the same thing. It was at this time that a federal and state investigation started. Rob's phone doesn't stop ringing. We started getting reports from the public, hey, there's, you know, spoonbill floating down here with their belly slit open. Or they would say, hey, I was went to this dead-end gravel road out here and there's 20 spoonbill laying there with their belly slit open. Paddlefish carcasses are piling up around Warsaw. Some are thrown into the woods. Others are tied down to rocks a la mafia style and sunk to the bottom of the lake, only to wash up on shore. Both males and females have their bellies slashed wide open, the eggs removed. And I knew that the problem had got here at that point, and uh, that changed our lives for a while. Caviar poachers have already decimated paddlefish populations in Tennessee and Kentucky. Rob is under no illusions about the threat they pose. We knew that it would If we didn't stop it, it would really affect the paddlefish population here in this area. Then, one night in 1986, Rob pounces. He catches an entire crew of paddlefish poachers working by the glow of the Christmas lights hanging off of a nearby bridge. The kingpins of this thing would hire local people for a certain amount of money to go out and set the nets, basically take the risk, in my opinion. And uh, we have a swinging bridge. It was built years and years ago, and it's kind of a landmark now where they always put Christmas tree lights on it. And they had launched the boat at the boat ramp just above this bridge, and we actually watched them running the nets and stuff. But after that night, we were out about every single night and watching these areas that we thought we needed to watch. Rob soon realizes he's dealing with a group that is far too big for his department to handle on their own. Plus, they're armed. He enlists the help of the Federal Fish and Wildlife Services, the agency responsible for interstate wildlife smuggling. They send him two officers, 
together, they hatch a plan to go undercover as poachers. Those guys would go to a bar that these guys frequented and they'd end up shooting pool with them and drinking and they created a rapport, I'm sure, that way. Many pool games later, the agents eventually win the trust of Bob and Neil Spanky DeFray, two brothers from Tennessee who run a poaching ring. The agents join their nighttime fishing trips, watching as they slice open the paddlefish and throw them back into the water. Bob Lumaduke was one of these agents. Here he is talking to PBS. These people were serious about what they did. They told myself and the other agents involved that if they did find out we were agents, that uh, they, you know, they would kill us. And we had no doubt that uh, they meant what they said. Not only did they all carry guns, but it was very dangerous being out there with them at night on the waters because we knew that uh, they could simply push an agent overboard and uh, hold them down with an oar or simply throw a net over them and then just say that uh, it was an accident. These people were in this for one thing, and that was for the money. Uh, they talked about caviar as black gold, and they were up there without any regard to the resource or what they were doing to the paddlefish population or anyone who got in their way. The DeFrays are shipping hundreds of pounds of paddlefish roe out of the Kansas City airport. A lot of it ends up with a well-known New York City dealer named Isidoro Garbarino, who labels it as Russian caviar and sells it to airlines and other businesses for up to $300 an ounce. That's a lot, even by today's standards. And this was 30 years ago. One bone-chilling winter night, some fresh faces out-of-town caviar kingpins show up in Warsaw. The people from out of state, they decided they were going to net one time by themselves, and we found out where they put in. They were out on the water netting. We knew where they had to come back. They had to come back to the boat ramp. Rob lies crouching on his stomach, hiding on the freezing riverbank all night. How do you stay awake for 24 hours? Well, adrenaline. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, our information from undercover guys was that they were armed and that they had made statements that they were, that they'd shoot us. You know, at least that's what we were told. They didn't shoot us, but they were armed. It would have been a bad mistake if they'd have done something wrong. Hours later, as dawn begins to break, the poachers return. That's when we approached them and identified ourselves. They had uh, several five gallon buckets full of eggs, the way I remember it, and they'd kill several fish that night. The funny part of this, when they came out, it was on Monday morning, we stopped them. We roadblocked them in, and we took them down. We had them laying out on the road, handcuffing them, and the school bus was trying to get through to pick the kids up to go to school, <laughs> and we had the whole road blocked. I remember that. The kids were all looking and hollering, and but... Uh, that was an excellent case right there. That really worked out well for us because that was the kingpin guys. Rob's team has enough evidence to send the DeFrays and their collaborators to prison. Garbarino, who is also found to be involved in international caviar smuggling, is indicted, but flees the country and goes on the lam, living in Italy and South America for 23 years. But in 2012, justice is finally served. At 69, Garbarino is arrested in Panama. He pleads guilty to smuggling more than $10 million worth of caviar. Rob's operation is a huge success. And after the 80s, well, things go quiet. And then the phone started ringing again about 2010. That's when we started getting complaints again. And you know, you get one call, that's one thing, and then the next thing you know, you get two or three more, and then you talk to the other agent in this, that's working with you in the county, and he's had three or four. Then you know you've got a problem. I did have a feeling of deja vu that, uh-oh, here we go. A storm is brewing. On the other side of the world, an unprecedented crisis is about to invite a new wave of criminals to the Ozarks. Caviar-related uh, criminal organizations can be violent. They want to protect the criminal activities that they run and also the criminal markets they benefit from. That's next time. The 
Paddlefish Caviar Heist is a production of Imperative Entertainment and Vespucci and is written and hosted by me, Helen Holliman. For Imperative Entertainment, the executive producer is Jason Hoke. For Vespucci, the executive producers are Daniel Turkin and Johnny Galvin. David Gavi Herbert is executive producer. Based on original reporting by David Gavi Herbert, the series producer is Aaron Keller. The story editor is Matt Willis. Thomas Curry is the managing producer. Audio recording by Austin Sizzler at Eastside Studios. Audio mix and sound design by Matt Peaty. Special thanks to Michelle Nyhaus for additional reporting. And special thanks to Betty Willis for the use of her documentary, The Paddlefish, An American Treasure, which can be found on her YouTube channel. <laughs>